Good day, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Military and Foreign Affairs Network. I am your host, the Voice of Reason. Today is part two of our ongoing coverage of the war between Ukraine and the Russian Federation. So I left off uh, discussing casualty rates and how it is affecting the uh, ongoing war efforts uh, for the Ukrainians. Higher casualty rates, meaning less people are wanting to serve in the military, which is causing an issue for the Ukrainian military. The uh, Russian military, on the other hand, while having challenges in regards to the recruitment of personnel, it is still recruiting 20 to 35,000 soldiers per month to serve in the military. Again, I've talked about this before. You do the math over the course of 12 months, 10 months, what exactly that looks like. Now, remember, uh, those fighters uh, probably will not, those soldiers will probably not be available for frontline duty for about four to five months if you train those individuals adequately. Now, remember, going back into World War II, those rates were much lower in terms of the requirement for, for training. War has changed. War is different now. A lot more technology is in play at this point than World War II. And I understand I have compared and contrasted World War II to this conflict, and I've been called out on that. But you still have to look at history. You still have to look at the perseverance of Russia. Forget it was the year 1940, 1942, 1943, 44, 45. At the end of the day, it is the perseverance of the Russian people. And remember, much of Ukraine was occupied for an extensive period of time by the German military. So it was the Russians. The Russians were doing, by and large, most of the fighting. Now, going back to this conflict, I had mentioned the possibility of the conflict lasting four years, and I received a very, very quick uh, comment on that. Essentially, if you look at the math, that is, that is impossible. Well, it's not. War is just not about raw math. If you take the Ukrainian population, whatever that population of, of fighting age males is right now, compare and contrast to the Russian uh, population of fighting age males, and then you get this, this number. There's a lot more that goes into that. It goes into strategy, technology, the competency of generals on both sides. Now, if the war lasts four years, does that mean the Russian military is incompetent? No, it doesn't mean that. It means that the Ukrainian side is getting help. What would this conflict look like if we had not seen billions upon billions upon billions of dollars being infused into the Ukrainian economy and the Ukrainian war effort by the West. I would argue that the war would probably look much different, don't you think? Now, four years, is that a long time? Should the Russian people, should the Ukrainian people brace themselves for a four-year war? Absolutely. 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 If we look at past wars, if we look at the Iran-Iraq War, the Korean War, to a lesser extent, World War II, I would argue that this war, the Russian-Ukrainian War, is on par with some of the greatest conflicts we have seen in human history. The media is doing a very, very poor job of covering the conflict, so it's difficult to see what's happening on the front lines. It is a brutal conflict. And go back to my earlier videos where I was covering the lead-up to war. 
And I said this was going to be, if it in fact happened, I was still speculative in terms of if it would happen, knowing the ramifications for both sides. And it has happened. The messiness of this war was as predicted. You have two very large industrialized nations. Ukraine is a very large nation, both size of territory and population. Even at at 25 million, whatever the population that remains in Ukraine after the great flight of those not wanting to partake in this conflict, there's still quite a few fighting age males that the Ukrainians can draw upon. And the same with the Russians. And the industrial capacity for the Ukrainians existed, although it doesn't exist as it did prior to the conflict. The Russians have destroyed a great much of the military industrialization in Ukraine. But the Ukrainians are able to replace that with assistance from the West. That's what's keeping this war going. But as I talked about in part one, because the Ukrainians are engaged in this offensive, counter-offensive operation, especially in Zaporizhia, down here in the south, they are taking very large numbers of casualties. The media in Ukraine is not reporting on just how bad it is. Because they have to keep the war effort going. If the true number of casualties were to be reported and hidden, which they are, the war effort would spiral out of control in terms of people in Ukraine opposing the conflict. I mean, these numbers eventually are going to come into light, but they are catastrophic, the number of casualties. And again, here in the West, you tend to only hear about Russian casualties. It's it's starting to leak out now. It's starting to get out that, hey, the Ukrainians are taking very large numbers of casualties. And part of the reason is the lack of success of this great Ukrainian counteroffensive that they, they launched without reasonable and rational thought because they didn't have an air force. The idea that the Ukrainians are going to be able to launch a successful offensive and retake this territory that the Russians have taken is is really nonsensical. And it's played out in this latest offensive. I, I believe that the Ukrainian counteroffensive that took place in Kherson, and then finally uh, the operation that took place east of Kharkov created this false sense of capability. I think even in the uh, Western military space, there were thought processes, well, maybe the Ukrainians can do this without an air force. Maybe the air defense capacity that the West has given the Ukrainians, and and given the perceived fact that Russian morale is so low and the Russian military leadership is so incompetent, maybe if we launch this offensive in the South that we are going to break the Russian military. And it was risky. Very, very risky. The Russians were able to consolidate forces in the south. They were also able to create multi-levels, multi-layers of fortifications. If you go back to World War II and you read the excerpts, the diaries of German soldiers 
invading the Soviet Union. Especially some of the battles that took place near Leningrad, outside of Moscow. They talk about the layers of defensive lines, the box mines. Miles and miles and miles, hundreds of kilometers of minefields. The Russians are employing that same strategy that worked in World War II. They are draining the Ukrainian war machine. Now, the problem for the Ukrainians is once this Russian war machine really gears up, and yes, it may be one year, two years from now, it may take that long. But when that Russian war machine gears up and goes for the throat of the Ukrainian state, this war is going to look a lot different. Just as it looked like in World War II. Again, I get the technology is different, it's a different age. But war is the same. War is the mobilization of the populace, of the nation-state, and the ability to persevere. Will the United States still support the Ukrainians a year from now, two years from now? What happens if there is a political shakeup in the United States? The economy in the United States is tenuous. The United States is divided like never before. So much so that I could, in a very short period of time, be talking about a civil conflict inside the United States. That's where we're heading. So again, uh, if as we watch the Russian buildup near Kupiansk, and now we know the, the Russians have not yet launched an all-out offensive east of Kupiansk, this area here. There is between 100 and 150,000 Russian troops massing, along with hundreds, if not thousands, of tanks and armored personnel carriers, lots of artillery. And then the question is, is because of this counteroffensive by the Ukrainians, has the Ukrainians put themselves in a situation where if and when the Russians launch this massive renewed offensive, is it going to collapse the Ukrainian military? Will we see this great flight from east to west as the Ukrainian military seeks to withdraw, possibly west of the the, the Dnieper River? Only time will tell. But again, I wanted to do a part two. I wanted to address some of the uh, comments, some of the concerns. Hopefully I've done that. Uh, we will have more content here very, very soon. We are continuing uh, to cover the uh, all-out civil war that's taking place inside the former state of Ethiopia and uh, some other uh, topics as well, including lessons in insanity. Have a good day.